Hello everyone, today we talk about Jean Froissart, born in 1337 and died after 1404, um, widely regarded as the greatest French chronicler. Um, Froissart is very well known to anyone interested in the late Middle Ages, late medieval warfare, the Hundred Years' War, for the obvious reason that he, if you look at, you know, his uh, just timeline, right? Biologically, you realize was um, essentially contemporary of, or very close at least in, in the adult age, even to the earliest um, Hundred Years' War uh, event, and wrote his, in fact, uh, masterpiece, the Chronicle, um, about, as we'll see now better, France, England, a and fundamentally uh, becoming thus the most famous source about the times in general. Um, it's difficult to introduce such a figure, you know, that I usually don't do biographies, but uh, I noticed that there is a sort of systemic uh, lack of information about uh, medieval France for some reason, I don't know uh, what's with uh, the cycle that I created regarding. I, I boosted that a bit uh, more, right? just like for Germany uh, and Italy, because of course you, you can't do really without them uh, in a essentially medieval European history based channel but also because this figure is so relevant, in fact from a, not just a historical but a historiographical point of view admittedly I, I really avow it, I've never been, let's say I've never worked um, with Froissart in a serious way. I did read uh, him, I did appreciate uh, his work. Today I want to render a little tribute to the guy, even as for the, the very interesting life that uh, we would have objectively like at least to follow closely in person, because this guy essentially was at the English court, at some of the um, he toured Western Europe, he, he was in, in Spain, in Italy, and he met with some of also the greatest uh, historiographical figures of his times, for example, Chaucer and Petrarch. And um, we would like, of course, to know always more, but I think it's important for a channel based on medieval history to look also at the figures of the uh, historians and especially of the chroniclers, as you know, I have uh, a pre I'm biased because I'm one of the greatest proponents, of course, of the on, of the reliability of the chroniclers for uh, the reconstruction of medieval history and specifically as a military historian, warfare. It is true, as we will see now, that Fursar is not, and there is a reason for it um, that is not just this guy uh, being uh, observable in a vacuum, right? In some ways unreliable, historically speaking. But again, there is a specific reason. This guy was uh, earning his bread, uh, let's say, uh, for a very specific audience. And for this reason, with very specific purpose, uh, as far as his historical work went, it's very fascinating to see how... how for example, the, the first book of, of the Chronicles, that is sort of the, the, the most famous one of his overall work in general, had uh, three, four editions. And these are initially, it will explain why pro English, then so pro French, and eventually even hating the English at last. Um, and um, this, however, doesn't take anything away from what, in fact, this author in his context did, that, that, that is, providing us with perhaps the single best, uh, let's say, uh, rendition uh, as a historiographer of 14th century French and English chivalry, uh, the, the sense of the feat of arms of, of, of the various knights, the, the courtly environment, what essentially his readers were mostly, not only at this point historically, noblemen wanted to 
to hear uh, in, of course, in also in an accurate way, but still not exactly for the purpose of a scientifically reliable historiographical work. And a guy just changed a court uh, during his life, as we will see now. So the thing had an influence on his work as well. So I really worked a lot on medieval chronicles. I uh, am particularly, um, let's say, I, I actually specialize on the generation before Frasar uh, and some, again, of the greatest names of, um, say, European chronicistics of the time, to, to which even the same Frasar is, is in depth. He is um, inspired by the work of, for example, Jean Lebel, but there had been other models like Villani, uh, etc., that um, really uh, came to exist historically uh, in a very particular context, each of their own, but that were still following a sort of genre of waves and storytelling at large. Uh, and that, in this case, come, in fact, from a, um, a third estator. All right. This is typical of, of the times, of the later Middle Ages, um, the fact that, um, say, historiography is not just written by some, um, let's say, clerk r r risen, say, just within a either a cluster or an or a um, a court. Right here, Frasar is a clerk, as many uh, great figures of his time. So, I don't know, even Petrarch was a clerk. It was normal because basically it would provide you with a revenue, then you could have and would have children, etc. It was a way to sustain oneself uh, and uh, to, at the same time, searching for more at court, but in this sense with a choice, right? This is not a 12th century clerk uh, within a feudal monarchy that was just hired because it was really close also to uh, very important families um, uh, in his clientary background, right? Here, there is a greater fluidity, a greater dynamic Right, and, and the guy is not commissioned, say, a history of this country, just per se. It's just more like properly a, a chronicle of many events that also fit, not just, again, a historiographical, but even a, a literary, um, uh, say, an artistic interest. Frasar wrote more than 14,000 uh, poetry verses. Um, this is interesting as well, because that's a uh, part of his work that is often overlooked. But evidently, he was essentially uh, working in many different genres just because evidently th this, these were requested. I don't know how many other videos we will make at least soon on uh, these figures. This is particularly for French history because such great name must be told at some point. I made just, I think, in 2021 a series about uh, Dante. Uh, which was essentially a history of literature one. And we can do these things because, at least if you are familiar with my content, I am not a historian of literature. I am literally a polymologist, so I tend to observe uh, mostly politics, warfare, per se, for us. Our wrote uh, is the, the major source for many of the Hundred Years' War most uh, say battles and the, the major ones um, and therefore he's uh, just like one of those authors who can't truly miss. I, I didn't advise him for example in the recent video I made on which kind of reds do you uh, so say advise for someone that uh, wants to start medieval history. There are many great names for Sar is one of them the point is working with the sources, which is a different thing. Even when you reconstruct a battle, you can't really uh, shop at the chronicle or supermarket, picking just the the lines that you're interested in and sort of remaining oblivious about the author and why he was writing the way he did. What 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 is his general reliability about? In this case, a a military event about combat, whatever. And Frasar is being recognized differently from other. Uh, chroniclers that uh, stand out for greater uh, at least reliability depending also on the um, the various events because of course that varied importantly more um, 
artistically inclined, or at least more into that sort of courtly uh, storytelling than, again, that objective sort of even rationalistic historiographical inquiry. There had been, uh, before I mentioned Villani, for example, that um, that actually is the name of family of three brothers that wrote, uh, but the first one is the that died in 48, uh, so when Froissart was uh, just 11, and then uh, he would write about some of the same events that Villani had witnessed, su- such as the Battle of Crecy, right? So you come eventually to make a synopsis of these works for battles, etc., but you had always to consider, again, what's their background. Um, Froissart was not only an exceptional poet and romancer, but also an esteemed figure of his time. He was definitely protected by some of the most powerful figures uh, of the Western European nobility. Uh, he was present at the English court, at uh, the, the one of Brabant, uh, the one of many other uh, French uh, noblemen. Uh, he was uh, in, in Milan. He really toured the world, right? His chronicle in this sense follows that general understanding that he will say, I will talk mostly about France and England, yes, but we'll talk occasionally about other stuff happening in the rest of the world, um, just to give a sort of fabulistic or novelistic sometimes touch to an otherwise sort of more familiar and at that point, uh, say, renowned uh, event where you couldn't, in fact, literally say whatever you wanted, right? Uh, I will spare you my complaint about how Anglo-Saxon historiography has developed a, a true idiosyncrasis towards chroniclers. There is a specific historical reason for this. Um, I come from a completely different uh, academic background, and as such, um, I tend to evaluate much more uh, chroniclers and their reliability. You, you should never, you should always distinguish between sources. But in this sense, you would immediately realize how unfair it is to dismiss narrative sources as, uh, first of all, one block for which there, as if there, ha- there was a standard reliability for each of them. And secondly, just um, the, the revealing in this way your, your ignorance regarding some instead of the most famous and reliable chronicles out there. Uh, that is unfortunately the problem, that if we, um, at least it's difficult to find scholars that are versed in a bit all of the sort of um, um, historiographical scenario of the time, right? You uh, you may legitimately specialize in a single region, but especially if it's Western Europe, uh, but this is valid for, for everywhere, it, Western Europe just being the most productive in terms of narrative sources and famous titles to compare. But you should be aware in that sense if you are not really just Hyper focused, just without looking around any, about anything, but at, at that point uh, arises uh, questions and the same heuristic value of, of your research. You should be able to evaluate, to assess also through these sources what stage of development different eras really had. Now, Frasar had an interesting background just um, natively because he uh, he is remembered like mostly as a French source, right? But he was actually a Flemish from the Holy Roman Empire. He was born in Valenciennes in the county of Hainaut, which made him, in fact, a Flemish subject of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, he uh, was, as you have already understood, like born in, a, in the same year that marked the beginning of the so called Hundred Years' War. So he was just a guy. Right, just like, you know, just like in our cases, being born while you know the 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 Western coalition was bombing the hell out of Iraq in 1991. Well, that those are the times. It's they are always very important. Like inceptionally, where what say what was the world um, that this guy had been born in? What was really going on? And so you know that that projects you uh, strongly towards more the future rather than. Uh, so of course the the before you were born that's sort of a um illusion that we have that somehow the times before our birth are so distant 
simply because we have not experienced them it's that you know they're much closer to at some point uh to, to to our you know to our birth than we are now you know as grown-ups right so um this is relevant fressar came from a modest uh, bourgeois family in uh, valenciennes again third estate um he he was not like for a particularly affluent family but he was of course just a guy who could uh get an education we had some connection so he was um let's say um the, the the area that we described here was outside the jurisdiction of the french kingdom um today valenciennes is france as a matter of fact um and it, it was obvious anyhow that the most lucrative opportunities uh were in the west at that point i just made a couple of days ago a series about princely germany it was a bit more of a complicated area um, the guy, of course, knew uh, French from an early age. Uh, he received a clerical education, after which he entered the service of the Counts of Hainaut. Right? First of all, locally finding this um, uh, power, let's say this, this aristocratic connection. And basically, for a certain life from this on, is an embarkment um, on a long commitment in many personal moral and cultural ways to serve powerful noblemen right and historiography sometimes is unfair because again especially the modern and contemporary authors say oh but the guy doesn't care about the peasantry and whatever why should have he right uh, i think i tell you it's never enough really but i spent enough words in other videos explaining what was the actual traditional belief about uh, the estates, the, their traditional balance, uh, etc. So we're not really, uh, we shouldn't be surprised about certain things just because we have been obsessed with the idea that, again, people are worth something that you cannot exclude, right? Most people are not that relevant, telling the truth. But it, this is also unfair towards Frassard that actually has a fairly good understanding of actually the, even the socioeconomical reasons behind what he dedicates a a substantial amount also of space to unavoidably given his his times to the late medieval peasant revolts he made lots of videos about that explaining a bit what they were about he seems to have been particularly sensitive likely because of his background to the um let's say the condi let's say the the condition of the poor um in the flemish cities right the, the flemish Euro flemish town and uh that could have been just something he witnessed, he felt for, uh, whatever. This is not so important, this is not to say that he was just, because he obviously worked for the nobleman, as just scholars were beginning to do from the, the crisis of the late Middle Ages, now depending on a court rather than just being a, you know, a citizen soldier or whatever, like in the previous centuries in, in urban context, really would be something strange or reproachable, right? Uh, Fossa's ability uh, to satisfy his aristocratic patrons and safeguard their interests was normally a defining aspect of both his character and his writing. In 1361, Fossa traveled to England, where he joined the ranks of Philippa of Hainaut, um, together with her uh, Claire, de, uh, Claire de la Chambre, so he was basically within the, the entourage, the milieu of the Queen of England, right? Philippa was, was the, the wife of King Edward III. So here we're talking about very high connections, and he, he stayed basically in the, in, in the retinue of the Queen. Um, Fressard remained in her service until her death that happened in 1369. Um, during this period, he also undertook extensive journeys, including visits to the Scottish court of David, King David, um, also southern France. Uh, he was in the entourage of the Black Prince. Uh, meaningfully enough, I made a video about the Battle of Poitiers that uh, is quite telling about the man, definitely. As well as um, accompanying Edward's second son, Lionel, 
Duke of Clarence, that was later to become a, a patron and protector of, of Geoffrey Chaucer, to northern Italy. In fact, Lionel was married um, in Milan to the uh, daughter of the Visconti lord, um, Violante, and it's on this occasion that uh, we know that because they were present at the marriage, um, the um, at the wedding, the uh, the the great authors, Geoffrey Chaucer, Petrarch, and Froissart were met. Right, so just imagine the situation, uh, and that tells you also the just the caliber of Froissart's uh, say connections, just per se. After the wedding, Froissart traveled to Rome before returning to England through Eno and Brabant. Brabant, as we will see, will become actually his later home. All right. Uh, these travels undoubtedly contributed to Froissart's pan-European perspective, which is very precious because it, it, it really does head towards that sort of Mm, first of all, it's not really a humanist, but, you know, that sort of universal awareness, right? Not just a parochially um, national uh, idea, right? He definitely is connected with, with the French and the English for the reasons we have already explained. But again, he was a Flemish background um, and he had traveled and would keep doing so. So he had an idea of the importance of the differences as well. Um, and this greatly influenced his chronicles that are a uh, true distillate of European culture at the time. doesn't matter how, again, courtly, chivalric, etc. He really offers um, a splendid sen scenario, right? A panorama of Western Europe at the time. Having served at the French court, of Philippa during his youth, as we've seen, Froissart developed a lasting and idealized image of a chivalrous um, paradise lost. Right? Um, this is particularly evident in his romance Meliodor, um, that, um, of course, uh, is uh, also a biographical ideal. Right? You know, it, when he had really acquainted this most splendid um, reality of royal caliber that would not really um, uh, enjoy later on, right? It would have, it would still be in very important courts, but not uh, truly in, in one of kings. Um, and so, together with this youth, those was the uh, that was the say the beauty for uh, you know times gone, right? Past. After Philippa's death, Froissart returns to his homeland in Eno, and he has to search for new patrons. Right? Philippa really liked him, uh, so it had been easy for him also to maintain himself, etc. Now he really had to make money in different ways. Right? He also, uh, even though he's a clerk, starts to uh, be in the in uh, merchandising. Right? He joins some crafts locally uh, to sustain himself. Um, at that point uh, in Hainaut, his most significant benefactors were Rob Robert de Namur, who died in 1392, uh, Guy II, Count, the Count of Blois, who died in 1397, um, who most likely encouraged him to keep on working on his chronique that had been uh, already uh, spotted evidently. Uh, uh, across this court uh, together with, of course, their author. And, and this was a chance, of course, f from this, um, for this uh, nobleman to win, of course, a place of elogium, of uh, positive um, press, even though the press was not yet there, um, from uh, in, in such a prestigious uh, and uh, work that would have been read extensively. Uh, out there, and this is a bit what, in fact, uh, Froissart works like, right? But in this sense, changing also uh, opinion, sympathies, uh, bias, etc., because he had to work, right? He had to earn, and he pleased his patrons in this way. Furthermore, 
um, Wenceslas, the Duke of Luxembourg and Brabant, who died in 1383. Um, he was a Luxembourg, right, by, by, let's say, by family, so th that was yet another prestigious connection. Uh, undoubtedly supported his uh, poetic endeavors, right? The, the guy had married the local heiress, so that's why he ended up ruling there. And um, Fressart definitely was a poet of his own merit. We know that Fressart entered holy orders and acquired uh, benefice in Les Etions uh, near Mont in 1373. By 1384, he became a canon at Chimay, and later on, he received another canonry at Lille. So we're basically all in, in the Flemish area uh, across the empire in France in the north, in the northeast of the latter. Uh, in the winter of 1388-89, Forsart spent uh, some time at the glorious court of uh, Gaston Febus, that was the Count of Foix, died in 1391 who was another famous aristocratic literary figure. Forsar also journeyed to the Low Countries uh, in a more extensive way. He made even a brief return to England in 1394. After that, we do not really know much about him. He uh, died uh, shortly after 1404, but we don't even know when specifically. Um, and uh, this would be sadly normal. There are great artists, uh, men of letters, scholars, etc., that are very famous in their day, but historically we can't quite uh, document their death because at that point we're not so productive, and so people would uh, sadly for say for forget about them, uh, not leaving major yeah, memories. Uh, Frassard's major accomplishment is, as we've seen, his work that is titled literally the Chronicles of France, England, and Neighboring Countries, which gives you already, you know, the, the scale of his um, interest uh, during the Hundred Years' War. Uh, this work covers the history of most of Western Europe from 1327. Uh, that's where it begins, right, from essentially the fall of Edward II, the, the, the beginning of Edward III's reign, to around 1400, uh, specifically the death of Richard II of England. While this history provides a wealth of realistic details, uh, it is written, as we were remember at the beginning, from a distinct standpoint. Right? Much like for Sartre's poetry, um, this work glorifies a romanticized international and chivalrous aristocratic life. Uh, as such, um, he is very attentive again to the individual uh, exploit, uh, feat of arms. There is a uh, great attention for properly the, the knightly dimension. There is, again, a, a firm awareness of the existence. Also in, in battle, think about you know the, 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 the passage on Crecy between the long bowman and the cross bowman um, during the battle and so on. But... Um, you can understand, of course, as it would be normal for, not just for Frassard and Tourage, but just speaking for most Western Europe, to reason mostly focusing on the feudal dimension. Um, and, um, and this also to please in the reading, not just um, to write a history for everyone for every side, unitly, that was engulfed in the same war against one another. So, um, up until 1361, Froissart's work is a reinterpretation of the true chronicles of Jean Lebel, uh, another important uh, author, um, covering the early years of Edward III's reign and the start of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, after this point, Frassard relies on, on his own observations, rumors, and sometimes even actual documents, of course. He was aware of different perspectives in history and made an effort to establish the facts, conducting uh, interviews with witnesses and participants in the events. Definitely in this course, there were the, the, the great knights um, of the time, and so depending on his, uh, say, uh, objective, he would be able to gather the information he, he really needed. Frassard extensively traveled to find sources, 
as well, uh, frequently revised the first two books of his Chronicles to align, as you were saying before, with changing political circumstances and the preferences of his patrons. Showing definitely that he wasn't, um, you know, uh, it, that there is a complexity behind that, right? He definitely he couldn't choose sometimes, but it's not true 100 percent. The fact that there is um, again a, a veering, like in, in the opposite direction, like from pro English to pro French to even properly anti English uh, later on, is is remarkable. Consider that his Flemish background probably allowed him to look at uh, France and England in a bit more of a detached way. I mean, Flanders, as you know, was one of the major um, casus belli uh, f uh, for for the Hundred Years' War, uh, and the um, the the sense is that, of course, he could he was nor French, strictly speaking, nor uh, nor uh, nor English, definitely. Um, so this allows him, after all, to to represent things. Um, if you want to, in a more international way, again, this is the age of great adventurers, traffic about John of Bohemia dying in the battle, Chrissy blind, like he was a, a, an errant knight, but think about, I don't know, battles like the one of Najera in northern Spain, um, like between, say, also the French and the, and the English, together with, with the local uh, contenders as well. We're talking about the great epopee of late medieval crisis of the reaffirmation of 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 the nobility of the ancien regime and these were really the great heroes of their times uh france and england were the champions of feudalism just as um you know national monarchies that had developed on that basis so there was from one side this sort of well enucleated uh, country divide to opponents just like in video games red and blue right uh and um uh, this sort of facilitated the same comparison, but also the um, uh, the, 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 the the spotting of the of the actual similarities. These countries were very similar uh, in, in actual fact. Also, as a military story, I must say that the more you study the Hundred Years' War, the, the least you actually see that stereotypical difference in english french warfare right their tactics were much more similar than than we think and we'll explain in other videos really why so um we tend to forget in this sense what europe as a whole especially western europe um was at the time how it had developed and the fact that many characteristics were r really shared at this point increasingly so the 14th century is really the moment in which even militarily speaking you have a complete equality, say from Portugal to Poland, from Norway to Sicily, you have basically the same armor, you have the same values, you have this truly European sense of of culture, of literature that has, has affirmed itself now in main pillars in some countries, but shared by by the others as well. So Frasar is in many ways the uh, the observer of this. You know, sort of you know, gloomier times than the one had been previous generations uh, but still enough to to observe in the, in the nobility this sort of compass right the fact that they were objectively once m maintaining the reins of the system and obviously directing it so uh, the peasants uh, tried to rebel but they failed clamorously um, they would go on under for half of a millennium uh, and Frasar witnesses this as well to a degree that could have not, you know, could, you know, he write in a in the in a royal court about peasants, what for, to what to what to what end? Especially considering that the nobility was sort of encompassing hierarchically those peasants, and the system had always been like that, especially in these countries. Um, it does, would have not made any sense. Now, Frasart chronicles are divided into four books. The first was reworked by the chronicler into four versions, uh, the ones we were talking about before. It covers events until 1369, 72, or 77, depending on the version. Following this, Froissart wrote the independent Chronicle of Flanders, which narrates the disturbances occurring in that region between 1378 and 
87, there is a battle of Rosa Becca, there is essentially the, the collapse of the Flemish. Um, at this point, uh, I made a video about this. If you go to the Medieval Flanders playlist, you understand what I mean. And obviously, as a uh, local, he um, he he appreciates the phenomenon in a, in a quite interesting way. Later, this chronicle would be integrated into the book two of uh, his major chronicles, which concludes with events in 1387. There are two versions of book two. The last two books only exist in a single version each, by the way. Um, the, uh, the third book covers events until around 1390 and the fourth until around 1400. Forsyth's chronicles are definitely a significant testament of elegant and efficient French prose, right? Forsyth is definitely uh, French literature, there is no doubt, achieved in uh, immediate broad and enduring acclaim. Again, the guy is is uh, the guy's work is the the breath of late medieval France. There is no way around. It's for, it's fourteenth century, okay, but in many ways, like in the picturesque fashion, he um, talks anecdotes, um, del uh, delineates characters. He just offers this. Um, in fact, literary, novelistic uh, uh, cut, right, of, of, of history of the time is uh, priceless. Um, these sources, by the way, were particularly admired in England, not only for initially their pro-English standpoint, which ha had been somehow inherited by the same, uh, from the same Jean Lebel, by Frassard, but also for their archaic and chivalrous perspective. Right. Uh, again, Frassard knew what were the estates that would appreciate uh, his work, and they were the the right ones for his for his fortune, for his fame. The chronicles serve as an invaluable resource, needless to say, for 14th century history, especially for readers who comprehend the aristocratic viewpoint from which Frassard observed it. Um, one should not anticipate profound explanations for political history or nuanced social commentary, though, right? Uh, as we said before, Frassard does understand actually a lot, um, but um, only in certain specific fields. Um, one thing that, for, for example, there's another author that is interesting to compare him with, that is Philippe de Comine, that is in the 15th century, we talk about him also because he was a, an actual uh, uh, man at arms. He says lots of interesting stuff about warfare. I, I made a video about that. It was not about Comine, but I mean, he, he was just for military history, like uh, a very precious source. Everybody realizes that for Sarv was, of course, again, a bourgeois, so it's a different background. Um, but Comine. And this, I think, speaks volumes about the, in fact, the importance of the aristocracy compared to the third estate. He's able to provide with actually deep, critical, and nuanced political assessments that also turn historically to be very objective. Frassard doesn't, right? Frassard is a sort of storyteller, uh, and he turns out to be also quite uh, imprecise about lots of things, dates, places. Even geographically speaking, he doesn't have that sort of true um, awareness, etc. That he just works for a purpose, right? He does it beautifully, but he is not there to answer deep historical questions. He's not the guy for doing that, right? He would have not um, done it in the first place because his perspectives were constrained by the views of his patrons, right? He um, was not there to make you comprehend the aspirations and growing influence of the bourgeoisie, even though he was from that same background. Um, he really was working for a very specific uh, bias and an objective, right? We do not, of course, we do not fully know how much of his ignorance is wanted, um, because, of course, if he doesn't talk about something, what, what do we know, right? But he's also unreliable in other matters, right? If you read, for example, the way he describes battles, um, 
like notoriously, people think generally speaking will know a lot about hundred years of, uh, uh, of the hundred years of war battle tactics. But actually, the, the this is not just Fressart's fault, but it, it, he's part of the, all that, right? Because of the lack of that need to actually make you sense what really happened. You really can't re be sure what actually happened in these battles. I mean, some things are easy to reconstruct if you apply military logic and you simplify interpretations, but you have to read through different authors to get the information that you need. Well, Frassard in this sense is also very, uh, very insightful as far as battles are concerned, but he's not there to explain you that either, right? Um, there was, of course, um, a disdain for the peasant uprisings during the Jacquerie in 1357 58, uh, or also its English equivalent led by Watt Tyler in 1381. Right? Uh, they, they all failed um, as uh, uprisings in, in the first place. Um, so it was obvious that he couldn't side with the loser, nor he probably had much sympathy for, for these. Uh, in the first place. His chronicles provide us um, uh, rather with a vivid reflection of the era, almost visually, right? Uh, the distortions of which can be more readily understood through the ideology that informs um, his poetry as well, that we will discuss now. Uh, but in this sense, you don't have to um, judge him for this. At least there are things that of course, he could have known better and said better, not said. But um, it's also, again, uh, his choice in for, for reasons that we will never fully know, uh, nor that it would make sense really to, to, in fact, judge before having evaluated historically, right? I'm one of those historians that says the only purpose of history is actually to judge it in many ways. Um, in the end, at least if you have acquired, of course, the, the actual expertise in it, because, you know, imagine studying it for a lifetime about a topic, knowing it before anyone else, oh, but you shouldn't judge it. Who said this idiotic thing in the first place? It depends, of course, on how you, uh, the, um, say, how, how you do it, right? What kind of purpose do you have to judge this? But, Judgment should arrive when you actually have an adequate comparative capacity, and not just because okay, this guy was. You know, I don't like him because I think that the peasants were good people. This is not exactly how a historian reasons uh, in the first place. Um, so, Frasar had this enormous poetic uh, production as well. He expertly crafted, and this tells you a lot about his education actually various forms of poetry, including lyric verse, narrative didactic poetry, and lengthy rhymed Arthurian romance as well, right? The latter naturally spousing uh, itself very well with his, as we've seen, courtly chivalric uh, milieu and uh, connections, right? Patrons, etc. Uh, for Assart, ly lyrical creations are many, really many, consisting of, again, 13 lay, uh, 6 chansons royaux, 40 ballets, 13 virelais, 107 rondo, and 20 pastorelles. And that, that is really uh, varied, right? These remarkable works have reached us through two meticulously transcribed manuscripts that are today preserved at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, um, codes um, 830 and 30, uh, 831, which were supervised directly by Frassard, we know that much, uh, to prove also how important this work was for him and how even it was requested to be that precise and detailed. Um, there is also a say, his narrative didactic poetry contained in this manuscript. Additionally, Frassart composed several servantois in, uh, this, these are uh, other verses, uh, in honor of the Virgin Mary. Apart from these, the majority of his lyrical poems written before 1372 exalt the ideals of courtly love, 
first and foremost. It was a bit the, the light motive, of course, of all these um, Western European courts, right? There is no doubt. While Froissart undoubtedly drew inspirations from Guillaume de Machaut, uh, that lived between 1300, roughly, and uh, 1377, um, which is evident, by the way, in both uh, Froissart lyrical and narrative didactic poems, there is actually no evidence to suggest that uh, he composed any accompanying music for his works, which especially in France was quite... Um, quite common now the, I mean it was a thing at least uh, France always had the, the most advanced musical tradition I made a video about French musical instruments um, in um, especially in the later Middle Ages like France had this uh, singing and uh, playing uh, the schools uh, that were connected also f with strongly with the courts because mainly they were for women uh, especially the singing ones and they um, they had to do with the sort of uh, education that a good noble woman would have to practice. I made, again, multiple videos about this. There is also another... But again, if you go into medieval French, uh, medieval uh, France playlist, you will, you will find uh, this uh, also didactic literature, what was the role of the woman, the noble woman, importantly enough, but not only. Now, the pastoral written by Froissart hold significant historical value due to their, to their inclusion of historical realia, right? They do tell us a lot about the world of the time, after all. These poems feature essentially love-struck shepherds who occasionally make references to historical events. This is another trope since, you know, classical um, literature. And while this guy's this fiction, six of these pastorelles uh, actually celebrate public occasions, uh, so they are allegorical. For example, uh, the arrival of, of Queen uh, Isabeau of Bavaria in Paris in 1385, uh, or the marriage of the elderly John, Duke of Berry, to the young Jean de Boulogne in 1389. These pastoral demonstrate a clear connection between Froissart's lyric poetry and his chroniques, uh, because they deal with the same characters, with the same symbolisms and ideals. A substantial portion of Froissart's lyric poetry exists in two versions, known as redactions, drafts. Um, many um, of these poems were not only characterized based on their genre, but also integrated, sometimes with slight modifications, into narrative deaths, also referred to as uh, Dithier or Traitier. The oldest of these redactions is the Paradis d'Amour, so the Paradise of Love, which consists of 1724 lines and features five lyrics inserted throughout, this poem follows essentially the style of the first part of the Roman de la Rose and presents uh, an allegorical dream vision in which the poet lover encounters traditional figures of the god of love, plaisance, uh, 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 hope, pity, and sweet looks in the garden of love that is a paradise. Right? These are themes that are, again, very old um, and uh, typical of courtly chivalric backgrounds. Think about even Wolfram of Eschenbach, uh, the, the Mount of Venus, all these kind of things. Um, and the protagonist recounts uh, essentially his love story to the god of love, uh, recites his poems and encounters his beloved who presents him with a daisy wreath, and in return the poet recites his ballade Sur toute fleur j'aime la mer Jerry. Uh, and um, the protagonist is awakened eventually by this uh, delightful dream by the touch of his lady love and this is beautiful because it sort of idealizes love and everyone who's been in love knows how you know how you can't fly with that um, and uh, of course there is a there is a structure there is a civilizational value a traditional hierarchy in all this what holds Significance specifically in this did is for our explicit connection between the love, dream, and the ability and capacity to compose lyric poetry.
which reveal an enormous artistic sensitivity of an author that otherwise is better known for his historical work, right? So never underestimate that. Also, because it really gives you a dimension of how uh, declined this, um, also the historical work really was, right? How to how many genres he could adapt, and so how you shouldn't consider him just as ah oh, yeah for Cyrus that chronicler that just wrote about you know the the hundred years of war battles right that everybody talks about but the guy holds a uh, really a remarkable place in probably in French literature ju just by his uh, his artistic po poetic skills there is the horloge amoureux um so the clock in love literally it's the only poem written in 10 syllable couplets unlike the others of the author that are in eight syllable lines it consists of 1174 verses that describe the functions of the clock which was a relatively new invention at the time right uh, it's uh, a bit like the pre-modern thing advancing before peasants really um, you know also the hours were counted on the basis of um, of the light it changed uh, that they could differ during the day um, and during you know across the seasons uh, now the the clock which is also a bourgeois invention by the way and especially of urban you know setting really something that scans time in in in, in a very different uh, way right and attracts in this sense the 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 attention of those who are seeking also for the, the precision right and uh, of um, if you want of the world of, of you know of the feelings it's highly likely that for Sarah examined the real Parisian clock in the tower of the Palais Royal on the very Ile de la Cité I made a video about medieval Paris by the way um, this um, visit may have happened by the way uh, during his return journey from Italy in 1368. Throughout uh, his poem Froissart compares his love-filled heart with the intricate workings of the clock. Right, It's a mechanistic metaphor that again maybe a, a bourgeois could uh, express better uh, in a um, sort of um, you know more mechan material bias from the highest spirits of still the what the noblemen were, were seeking in, the, in their lives and in their idea of just of their uh, of their ancestry their seed of how they 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 lived uh, that legacy itself um and, and it, this makes us for start looking after all from this more aristocratic milieu to if you want some um, a more modern concept right and something that makes you think about the complexity of the universe how how this reflects within us right it was also a traditional concept but now it's uh, connected with this technology uh, for example fear in the poem is symbolized by the folio or bar balance beauty is represented by the main weight desire is embodied in the mother wheel uh, which all makes sense uh, uh, doesn't it uh, moderation is associated with the quote scape will um, uh, sweet talk is linked to the striking will and so on right so it's very vivacious uh, as a as a figure the Frasar was at least have this idea had a vibrant sort of intellect that uh, probably made him quite an interesting character also in the in the limits he could reach in in his creation or in his way of really entertaining even this the, the his audience artistically each component um, of the clock mechanism by the way corresponded to an uh, allegorical representation of courtly love creating a well-structured and symbolically rich system the description of the clock's workings in the poem is so precise and detailed that it was cited and partially translated by an, an English historian of horology demonstrating its accuracy and value um, so that you you realize there was even a, a mechanical understanding and interest just like the chronique uh, the aforementioned poem is a testament 
the Horloge Amoureux to Froissart insatiable curiosity about the world around him. This is probably also what brought him to, to move, aside from the, the various courtly events that obliged him, like with having lost his patrons, right, to, to go find someone else. But um, it has also to do with a life literally spent across the world. He was also in Spain. He, again... Uh, he really saw this world. He was really enjoyed that. He, he was really thirsty of knowledge, and uh, and uh, in, in in this sense, like very much a, a medieval mind, right? Remember that there is never um, thirstier uh, uh, man for knowledge than the medieval one, right? The Enlightenment even has nothing to do with that. It was mostly about categorizing um, uh, information. Uh, medievals are here looking at the world in O and saying, you know, we must sort this out. Because this is really a huge clock, right, that we have to sort out the mechanisms of so that we can uh, gain a, a deeper a deeper wisdom, a deeper truth. But there is another work, the Epinette Amoureuse, consisting of 4,198 verses with 14 lyrical insertions, presenting uh, an improved version of its predecessor. Firstly, it begins with a lengthy pseudo-autobiographical introduction, delving into the poet's childhood and emphasizing the early blossoming of his affectionate nature. Subsequently, uh, the poet immerses himself in a dreamlike vision, where he finds himself in the presence of esteemed figures such as Juno, Pallas, uh, Athena, Mercury, Venus, and it's Venus who bestows upon him a gift, a heart that is cheerful, beautiful, and filled with love. This is from line 547. The reminder of the poem bears a striking resemblance to the Paradis, uh, consistently captivating its readers. As much, um, I'd say the poet's lover happens upon his um, beloved lady, and together they engage in the exchange of heartfelt poems and share moments of blissful dancing as well. However, their joyous encounter is short-lived, for the lady is bound to wed another. Dun, dun, dun. Unfortunately, um, then, of course, uh, this yeah, resonates uh, to, to, to many, at least, heartbreaks. And devastated for this reason, in fact, the poet's health begins to deteriorate, and his emotions oscillate in a tumultuous dance between hopeful anticipation and crushing despair. And this is so very realistic, after all. Um, then there is the prison amoureuse, so the, the prison of love, basically. Um, this is a work um, of 3,895 lines comprising 16 inserted poems and 12 letters written in prose. Its underlying narrative, hidden beneath the usual allegorical guise, recounts the true tale of the aforementioned Wenceslas of Luxembourg, who was taken captive in the Battle of uh, Besweiler in 1371 and awaited his brother, that was the Emperor Charles IV, uh, to pay his ransom, all right? Uh, the guy's father had, uh, you know, been John of Bohemia, had fallen at Crecy. Um, so it's all about this, I mean, about people that really had this very strong chivalric lifestyle. Right. And that, in this regard, also cared enormously, dynastically speaking, about their... I mean, love as a place to really measure God's reward. Um, uh, as that, that is actually the truest traditional meaning, or since in the European times and beyond, regarding the, uh, you know, the ultimate purpose of the, the fighter, the holy war as well. And the core of the narrative is formed by the seven letters penned by Rose. The Rose is Wenceslas, and the five letters by Floss, flower that is Froissart. Mm -hmm. And through these um, correspondences, here we see also the hierarchy, right? The Rose, 
um, versus the generic flower, right? The un an inspiring one in a way, or at least one that is you know separated by a rigid hierarchy. And through these correspondences, the uh, intricacies and nuances of courtly love are contemplated. Uh, it's fascinating because it's a high dialogue after all. It's worth noting that Machot Voir dit that dated to 1362 roughly um, had blended letters and verse narratives playing a notable role in popularizing this literary technique. But here the, the two characters uh, say uh, under their alices are definitely uh, very very relevant. Um, and there is a, a notable difference. While Machaut's work presented a tangible storyline, Froissart's prison amoureuse uh, replaces the plot with two exemplars. The first entails a semi mythological love story recounted by Floss, and the second delves into a, an allegorical vision experienced by Rose within which the genuine account of Benceslas imprisonment can be discerned. All right. Which, uh, of course, can transpose the actual, the actual imprisonment from, the, 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 say, the allegorical one uh, of love. We have this other work, the Julie Busson uh, de Jeunesse, which is, in fact, Froissart's longest and most ambitious, consisting of 5,442 lines containing 27 inserted poems. It's a dream vision that occurs to uh, Froissart when he was 35, uh, 35 years old, specifically on November the 30th, 1373. And in his dream, he is led by youth, um, an allegorical bush populated by mythological and allegorical figures. Um, this is fascinating because even in Dante, you know, that 35 years old was considered like the half of somebody's life at the time. And so it, it's relevant that the guy looks at youth uh, at this point, basically past in his life, remember how, you know, uh, the, the court of Philippa of Hainaut had been idealized by Froissart as well. It's mixed. Now, upon awakening, the poet recognizes the real danger and directs his thoughts towards the Virgin, whom he praises in a lay. And uh, this is the, 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 the thing. It's just like Dante that says, you know, in the midst of, of the path of our life, we had lost our way. Now instead, right, and of course his journey begins. Um, so the Virgin Mary transforms into the um, into the libusson replen du sang that means the uh, you know the, the shining blossoms um, this is the line uh, 5402 and her son the Christ is described as elle feu plaisant non ardent mais illuminant Third lines uh, well, okay, they are the following ones, basically. Uh, similarly to the <coughs> Horloge, we have also the Temple d'Honneur, the Temple of Honor, which spans across 1076 lines, uh, lacking any inserted lyrics, uh, however, and with this allegorical, yet another allegorical dream, Honor unites his son Desire with Lady Pleasance in matrimony. Uh, Foursart refers to this poem as Traitier de Moralité rather than a Amour. As a matter of fact, a significant portion of the Traité revolves around Honor's extensive moral sermon on love and marriage, and it's highly plausible that the temple is in fact an epithalamium dedicated to the celebration of a genuine couple, as we've seen also in other works. In addition to these five bits, Froissart composed six shorter lyrical narrative poems. The Dit du Bleu Chevalier, with a length of 504 lines, which tells in a complex metrical pattern the poet's attempts to console a lovesick knight clothed in blue, 
symbolizing fidelity, importantly enough. Uh, the Jolie Moi uh, de Main, this is um, uh, still a, a trope of, you know, à la guerre que Jolie in spring, but talking here in 464 lines with three lyrical in insertions um, about uh, Nightingale praising the beauty of his lady love. It's a purely lyrical composition. Um, equally lyrical is the Di de la Marguerite, 192 lines, where the poet sings the virtues of his flower lady love, the Marguerite, in fact, Marguerite, and the um, Plaidoirie uh, de la Rose et de la Violette, 342, which um, exemplifies Froissart's flattery skill. As a good courtesan, these two flowers, in fact, plead with the French court to decide which of them deserves more praise. Um, presided over by the esteemed, quote, uh, noble at haute fleur de lis, which is, of course, the symbol of the Capetian monarchy, we are line 308 of the work, and supported only by the usual allegorical figures prov of provost, youth, sense, generosity, and honors, but also by the dukes of Berry, Burgundy, Eau, and uh, La Marche, right, so actual historical figures, the court will someday pass judgment on all flowers, including Frassar's daisy. Um, so they, they, they're sort of this literary tensions to a degree to convince right, what is uh, more than the other and everybody has their own ideas the final two D lacking in inserted lyrics or mythological allusions but they exhibit a more pronounced autobiographical quality that helps us understanding for ça the débat du cheval et du levrier consisting of 92 lines portrays Froissart return from Scotland where he accidentally eavesdrops on a conversation between his horse and greyhound loyal animals delving into their cons uh, uh, contrasting experiences uh, of joy and sorrow in their existences right the D de Florent spanning across 490 lines unfolds as a thought-provoking discourse between Froissart and very last of his coins, serving um, as a poignant testament to his squandered wealth as well, which uh, was also a motive, like saying, you know, not really devoid of some nobility or egos, right? There is a lot of, uh, say, courtesy seekers in the sense of actual clientary uh, support, Right when you hear about we we want courtesy, there is a famous sonnet by the Tuscan poet Folger de San Gimignano that says, "I ask for courtesy. Courtesy in this means essentially being maintained at some powerful nobleman's court, naturally in exchange for a service." Um, and here, for Sart seems to just fit that broader uh, clientary tradition, even though he's a 14th-century bourgeois. The poet narrates um, to us regarding the 80 florins, specifically, you know, the fis fiscal. Remember, he was into merchant stuff, right? And he received from the Count of Foix, as well as more significantly acquaints us with the fact that during his time in North uh, Fressard diligently read a passage from his Melodor to the Count um, every night for a duration of 11 weeks. So if we look at Froissart's reliquial and lyrical narrative poetry, we can see a close adherence to the literary standards established by Michel. Um, however, his verse romance, Meliodor, stands out as potentially even more original as it consciously returns to a much older tradition. In addition, Froissart introduces 79 lyric poems from his patron Wenceslas of Luxembourg, a noteworthy addition that adds to the work's uniqueness in contrast to many 14th century romances which often take the form of prose retellings or continuations Meliodor tackles a fresh subject matter while maintaining the traditional octosyllabic couplets 
This prolonged romance comprises over 30,000 lines, although it remains incomplete with two gaps. It transports uh, readers to a youthful Arthurian court that could be aptly described as the enfants de la table ronde, that is to say, uh, you know, the childhood adventures of the round table. Uh, Meliador narrates the countless escapades of numerous knights errant, uh, primarily centered around jousting, which made an enormous part of 14th, 15th century sort of nobiliar sponsoring. I still have to make a video about this, I think, three years ago or so. I made a video about medieval tournaments, but I have something in store because it, it's really a, a much more important topic than when one may imagine, especially at, at this point. Um, you have really the, the rise of jousting as. Uh, the establishment was starting to be a bit pickier about their direct involvement in war. If we look at all the nightly disasters um, from of the French during the Hundred Years' War, but still the size of the country, the fact that monarchs had to be more detached, but many, uh, say, especially of the lower uh, classes of knights, were to make a living, not just as mercenaries, but in peacetime, even though, of course, there was always some work to go to, um, uh, increasing the skill and fame, of course, uh, they would start de participating serially, professionally, to tournaments, and so that's something which, uh, you know, generated much uh, admiration and legions, and, you know, this was both warfare and, uh, say, mock combat, but they also in mock combat actually they actually smashed each other i mean a few centuries before it was there was literally no difference between warfare and tournaments whatsoever um including the dead and all um, but uh, at this point everything becomes also about selection quality the elite again uh the late medieval crisis brings to that refinement within the same hierarchy so it was a very interesting competition uh, nonetheless, and so in fact, the, the the knights errant at this point are sort of naturalized into this other type of activity in for a certain time. Nonetheless, a clear overarching plot emerges. Hermione, a princess from Scotland, is promised to the knight who emerges as the bravest through a series of tournaments arranged by the noble ladies. This is fascinating. Um, and uh, you often have it also because you know that the lady um, is essentially the angelically transfigured soul, uh, dark soul of the same knight that manages to tame and possess her, and so to elevate to the higher standards. And in fact, it was very often the, the arms of the knight uh, escorted by the, the lady in a page that has made the presentation at tournaments, especially in this later time, this is quite fascinating and there are lots of sexual um uh you know uh, implications as well i mean the fact that the the lady would present herself uh the day after the fight with the clothes of the knight stained in blood but that sort of became her own uh so that that's something which we can talk about also in other videos uh in any case um Look, going back at Froissart's work, the protagonist, Meliodor, happens to be the son of the Duke of Cornwall, so other uh, Arthurian, uh, say, setting with uh, background that epitomizes the ideal knight errant, right, par excellence, you could, you could say. Um, eventually, he not only wins Hermione's hand, but also claims a Scottish kingdom. This was actually the great thing behind errant knights as well, not just uh, say ideal love, but actually a rich heiress of some sort uh, and um, while in this case his companions secured their own lesser, lesser princesses so you see here that the rigid hierarchy based on value, it's typically traditional and these knights know much better by their background at this point they wouldn't really write much themselves so we, we get the stuff from men like Frasar but that's how alive actually the the ancestral meaning of this all um, 
really was still at this point right moment of contraction actually there's a bit of nostalgia in these works i made a video that i think is about the chanson de geste that actually tells about this let me check yes chanson de geste as traslatio imperi as a matter of fact this is specifically about france and it's a very instructive video regarding this topic if you're interested in the Renovatio Imperi and in the Renovatio and Translatio in this case. But um, the general meaning of this uh, epos, this chivalric epos that here for us are still echoing. Um, commenced, in fact, these are the years in the early 60s of the 14th century, Meliodor was only completed after Vence's last demise in 1303, uh, 1383, excuse me. The poem is heavily influenced by Froissart's early service in Great Britain, where of course he had drawn plenty from that sort of Arthurian um, British background. Uh, even at in, in its portrayal of geography and ideology, there is a lot of this, and serving as an unbashed celebration of chivalry, the work implicitly yearns for its revival in Frassard's time, uh, highlighting how this was effectively pa felt already as past, right, aside from the literature. I mean, don't get me wrong, the men-at-arms were hell of warriors, and, and, and etc., but there was something to the original that here was sort of escaping in many ways. Um, and it's fascinating that a bourgeois would be so acquainted to, to that, um, and this speaks again of Froissart's culture and literary education. Uh, and in this sense, Melidor plays a significant role as a form formidable link between his poetry and his life's crowning achievement, the idealizing and restorative chronique. Right, the chronique have, as Froissart's biggest work, this task also of showing a bit more what really chivalry was made of, right, rather than sticking to the historical account per se, right. Um, a very highly, um, say, political, civic, right, and uh, mentality like uh, Villani in Florence in the previous generation could sort of look at these battles and, st and still you see there in essentially in an Italian merchant that the deep awareness of chivalric values and uh, importance etc um, because these things were actually seen in within the same uh, within the same uh, Florence here we've seen it, even Milan was a very chivalric court it's no uh, surprise that Forsar was there and then Petrarch was there and that there is a bit the sense of withdrawal right from the older time, we are in the full crisis of the 14th century, there is a lot of death, a lot of re rebellions, there is a sense that the nobility is challenged, right, and so um, what these guys want to hear is a history that celebrates how much they were in charge, as they would remain uh, valiantly, and how, of course, this was more important than the history in itself, right, so for Sartre could not really, from his Flemish, French background could not really um, escape this, right? It doesn't matter how, you know, relatively influenced by... I mean, Hainaut was not really like, uh, you know, Bruges, uh, Bruges, Ghent, yeah, but it was something else, right? Valenciennes, Mont, these were the places from which um, Frassard actually comes from, and they're slightly more feudal, right? And it's part of the reason why they're also in part from the Holy Roman Imperial side, jurisdictionally, but um, the still, in fact, the feudal world is all around. You can't quite escape that. I made recently a video on uh, Flanders. Really have a, a decent playlist on that. Um, and if you look at uh, yeah, for the 14th century crisis in urban society, the case of Ghent made a bit about that, but also the, the Count of Flanders, the Flemish Communes, and the King of France, political history of the 14th century. These are Frassard's times, right? And they open your eyes on what actually happened in Flanders, which was a ruinous urban collapse, um, politically, first and foremost. 
uh, and uh, where the French actually would benefit a lot and um, and so this is the in many ways at least uh, an, int an introduction to to the man to the to the historian to the poet to the man of letters and always remembering his European background his awareness about uh, the literary models the, the political situations the other um, the other uh, say uh, achievements let's say of, of the uh, of the enemy let's say of, of the other of the other in a, in a sense I'm talking the enemy because I'm actually watching a video on Facebook of a uh, you know Ukrainian Bradley making um, you know a T nine M uh, Russian T nine M explode so I came up with enemy by the foe um, and um, the uh, but you know what I mean about the uh, the actual openness of Frassard's vision and so even the criticism against his unreliability is perhaps too standardly said just because he writes a history and so we're supposed to think oh well everything he has he writes has to be that but you have to consider why he was writing that and if you get that you can sort of accept even the, the limits of a great of a great artist of a great historian and, and most importantly a man of his times so that's I think particularly um, more relevant than many other aspects I would say and for today however uh, I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time